old Lucy DeFranco of Bainbridge has a tradition. Ooh, sick. <laughs> That's a good record. Every morning as she waits at the end of her driveway for the school bus, Lucy pops out of her mother's sunroof and waves at people driving by on Chagrin Road. It felt really good because like people like when I waved to them. A smile, a wave, all reminders that it's the small things in life that we miss because for some, those small things have the greatest impact. Dear little waving girl, one of the things I miss most during this time that we're all isolated is those mornings when you're out waving so nicely as you're waiting for the school bus. With roads void of those yellow buses, David Shaw misses seeing the little waving girl who could always change his mood. Sometimes you're grumpy and not feeling well and, and not looking forward to another day at, at work and Lucy always just brings a smile to my face and makes me think everything's okay. Straw, who owns a painting company minutes away from Lucy's house, surprised the second grader with a small gift and card to say thank you for her act of kindness. For Lucy's mom, the surprise gift is a reminder that kind gestures can continue amidst everything that's going on. In Bainbridge, Danielle Wiggins, 3 News. The doors of this Cleveland Eastside Church are closed to in-person gatherings. About six miles away, the same is true for this mosque. The leaders of these two houses of worship may not share a common religion, but they do share a belief about COVID-19. There's predominantly African Americans that are being affected by the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. So I just can't, I can't, I can't take a risk at it, period. I don't know what I would do if one of the members of our congregation contracted COVID-19 in a service and then, you know, subsequently passed away. That would, that would literally break my heart. Both Pastor David Hughes of Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church and Iman Abbas Ahmed of the First Cleveland Mosque have predominantly black congregations with older members at risk for complications with COVID-19. We have to survive, we have to eat, we have to do all of those things, but we have to, we have to be very careful in terms of how we can, how we can expose people and how people can expose us. COVID-19 statistics from the Ohio Department of Health show the disease disproportionately impacts blacks. The community only makes up 14% of the population, but account for 25% of Ohio's COVID cases, 31% of hospitalizations, and 17% of deaths. What that means is that it's literally wiping our congregations and our nationality out. Pastor J.K. Rogers, who leads a Christian congregation in Akron and connects consistently with his over 46,000 YouTube subscribers, says all races should take the virus seriously. But just as quick as it can be passed to our African-American community, it can be passed to yours. Good morning. How are you doing? I'd like to extend my greetings to all by saying assalamu alaikum. So for now, these faith leaders plan to continue to serve the spiritual needs of their members through online services and staying connected using technology. We have to do the right thing. We have to do things that's going to, to make sense to us to make sure that most people are safe and that we can continue to ride through this until it becomes a better day. And out of the three faith leaders that I spoke to for this story, only one of them had a member who was diagnosed with COVID-19. And Dave, thankfully, that person did recover. Yeah, absolutely. We do look for the better, better day. A church sanctuary nearly empty just minutes before the bride walks down the aisle. It's not a ceremony where the invited guests didn't show up, but instead it's a wedding in the era of COVID-19. We just really wanted to, to do it. We were scared that we weren't going to be able to like be together during all this. That's why Olivia and Cody Rogers pushed their April 4th wedding up to March 18th. They were supposed to marry in front of 150 guests, but that number dwindled down to 10. We had just married my other daughter in January to a full church, and it's definitely not what we expected. 
The decision also meant that the father of the bride was not expected to physically attend. Last summer, George Eunice was diagnosed with an incurable form of cancer. On the day of the wedding, he was hospitalized recovering from a stem cell transplant meant to prolong his life. And then I said, well, no matter what, I still want the wedding to go on. But that didn't mean the wedding would go on without his presence. We decided to just kind of patch him in on one of our phones and they, they kept the phone with them everywhere they went. From walking the bride down the aisle. Who gives this woman to be married to this man? I do. To giving her away. I didn't know I was so involved. George was there by phone through it all. And I didn't feel like I was really there, but I felt really honored that they wanted me to be present in some way. But I'm praying that an angel would love me. And that included a recording of George singing one of Olivia and Cody's favorite songs during the lighting of their unity candle. I almost started crying. I'm surprised I didn't. It was just, I don't know, it was really beautiful to hear him sing the song. I'm glad she's happy. It's just showing that we all have to try to make things work out. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you all for the very first time, Mr. and Mrs. Cody Rogers. I'm blessed that it worked out. Danielle Wiggins, three news. Should I be gunned down tomorrow? May the news headlines paint me beautiful. Her words. Paint me truth. Arrest you. Paint me in full color, not just in black. Paint me human. Raja Bell Freeman, the Cleveland State senior who... Really writes and speaks her own truth. She's not scared to say what's on her mind. Should I be gunned down tomorrow? May you remember my words and know that I don't deserve to die. See, what do you hope people take from your writing? The truth. She uh, really does a great job of writing the truth, but also writing it in a way um, so that it sucks and pulls others in. And as you hear my words in this moment, remind yourself that the price for one small mistake should never be death. Her voice developed through research. The more I learned about what was going on around me, the more I knew how I felt about it, the more I knew, you know, how I wanted to speak. Raja's ideas expressed through her poetry is how she says she pushes her words into others to get them to understand her message. It's a skill she's now trying to teach other youth of color. I want to help them be themselves on paper. Perfect. Raja does this as a support instructor through 12 Literary Arts, a nonprofit founded nearly four years ago by Daniel Gray Contar. And Raja is a part and a very important part in moving the tradition of the black literary arts in this city forward. 12 provides a safe space for writers to focus on imagination and social justice. And you come out as a young, inspired poet. Know that I have never, ever lost a game of never have I ever. 10 fingers always pointed to the sky. And we have Raja's full performance of Never Have I Ever posted to WKYC's YouTube page. You can text the word POEM to 216-344-3300 and we'll send it to you with Raja's explanation of the deeper meaning of this poem. So the poem actually uh, is about Michael, R., uh, Michael Brown who was shot and killed a few years ago by a police officer and he was unarmed and his case was one of the cases that really gave momentum to the Black Lives Movement, uh, Black Lives Matter. And so Raja and 12, what they do is they encourage people and encourage youth of color to really speak about uh, social justice and to tell their truth to people in places of power. Hi, I'm Addison Captain, and I am nine years old, and I am the owner of Brown Backpack. Yep, you heard correctly. Nine-year-old Addison runs her own online business. I'm not like the other kids who play video games. I like doing business work instead. And work she does, Addison has spent the summer designing products to sell on her website, brownbackpack.com. She's even perfecting her sales pitch. My business is um, lots of things that inspire children of color. So we make backpacks. We have books on the website. 
We have phone cases. Far beyond the treetops. And many of those items display images from an inspirational book Addison's mother Stephanie wrote. Um, so many times we find that it's really difficult for us to find products that show you know, people of color in a positive light. So like any good entrepreneur, Addison decided to fill the gap. So this is the bag that I just made. She has close to 100 products on her site, ranging in price from $10 to $45. She's learning everything from marketing. So this is a bag that I really like. To product development and pricing. Sales are still going well. Addison has made a little over $200 in about four weeks. This is how we do it. And she has advice for those who want to fly high as an entrepreneur. You only need a little bit of effort and you can create something big. 6.32, this morning we continue our Miracle series with the story of five-year-old Gabrielle Richardson standing at just two feet, 10 inches tall. The kindergartner at DeWitt Elementary School in Cuyahoga Falls is the smallest student in her class. Yeah, but her tiny stature doesn't take away from her giant story of survival. Danielle Wiggins has why this little girl is being called a miracle. We're proud to be Black Tigers. Her voice, squeaky. Her eyes, big, beautiful, and focused on learning. Her mother, proud to finally see her daughter, Gabrielle Richardson, take her seat in a normal kindergarten class. Definitely brings tears to my eyes just thinking back to when she was a baby and just how scary it was and not knowing if she was going to make it based on what the doctors were saying. She was a complicated patient, I would say, and, and, and it was a difficult case. Gabrielle was born 10 weeks early with gastroschisis, a birth defect where a baby is born with their intestines outside of their body. The small intestine got cut off, basically, so all of the blood flow stopped and the intestines were killed. So she only had uh, 10 centimeters of a small intestine, and normally it's at 200 centimeters. Gabrielle was diagnosed with short bowel syndrome. The doctors were telling us was that, you know, she's not going to survive. Gabrielle's condition stripped her of the ability to eat naturally. All nutrition was supplied through IV, a process that could lead to liver damage. I was very upset. Uh, I just, like my daughter was born a few hours ago and you basically have a shovel in your hand digging her grave. The Richardsons turned to their faith and prayed nonstop for a miracle. God answered all of our prayers. He healed her. And the IV eventually came out. She has never needed an intestinal transplant. She's never needed a liver transplant. How's that food, Gabrielle? Good. And she's finally eating, something she didn't learn to do until she was four years old. Chicken and french fries, yum. And although Dr. Ronaldo Garcia always believed Gabrielle would survive, he's still utterly amazed at her progress. Has been a fantastic transition, you know, from, from somebody that was really critically ill in the in ICU almost with no hope, you know, of surviving to somebody that now uh, goes to school and have a normal life. And so it has been a, has been a miracle, you know, I would call it that. Oh, and the Richardsons say there's one more miracle. I received a call from Atkin Children's um, and they said, hey, we just found out because Gabrielle's condition is so rare, Medicaid is going to pay for everything. And I said, excuse me, what? Yes, that's right. The Richardsons don't have to pay for Gabrielle's expensive and extensive medical treatments. A miracle is a miracle. She is truly a miracle. I've watched that three times this morning. I could watch it 33 more times yeah, today. Up. Unbelievable story, Danielle. Um, I, miracles happen.